Hello everyone and welcome back to International Trade Live. Now I'm joined by Professor Carl Stephen Patrick Hunter, OBE, who is chairman of Coltraco Ultrasonics, which is a high exporting advanced manufacturer exporting to 120 countries and also the chairman of the British Exporters Association. And Carl, your responsibilities don't end there. Could you give us a brief overview of the other things that you do? Well, I, I mean, I don't want to bore anybody, uh, but I, I have got to the stage in my life where where, um, where I'm very fortunate to do the um, amount of array of roles that I do. So you're correct. I'm the chairman of a high exporting advanced manufacturer and that, and that I've built over over 30 years. And I'm very proud of that. And some of your team know me very, very well and have supported us in many ways over those 30 years. So we never forget your kindness at your, at your house. Um, and yes, I am chairman of the British Exports Association, and that gives me it gives me great pleasure to help represent what is, after all, a, a, a hugely successful part of our economy. On the downside, only eight percent of UK companies export at all, and that's that's not a good thing. But the great thing is that we have never exported more than we do today. So the the year on year figures, for instance, for UK exporting is that we're at around 882 billion pounds. We have never done more than that. 400 plus of that was in services and we've never ever exceeded 400 billion in our entire post-war history. Um, so Carl, with the global trade environment that um, obviously is just constantly evolving, what would you say are the emerging trends in exporting from the UK that businesses should be aware of? And how do you think that they could adapt in order to seize new opportunities? So that's one of the best international trade questions I've been asked. So if you go back all the way, yeah, well, it's because if you go back to, say, 2008, when you had the global financial crisis, we've then had a series of what otherwise would be considered systemic shocks. You've had the recovery from the global financial crisis, which has resulted in you know, we all talk about low interest rates, but in fact, there's been reduced liquidity because the consequences of global financial crisis was that we increased the reserves that the banks had to hold to make them more resilient. But then you've had Ukraine, you've had COVID-19, you've had a whole number of systemic global interruptions, energy prices, all of these things that you know uh, probably even better than me. And what that's meant is that it, there's, a, there's a huge opportunity in question mark well, how could it be that the UK has actually come out of all of those with the highest export figures that we've ever had, whilst concurrently managing uh, a, a collectively impactful series of global events that have, that have directly uh, affected business and industry globally? How have they managed to do that? And my only answer to that is that they've built, uh, they've, they've built greater levels of resilience, diversification and growth. And that was our own response, for instance, during COVID-19, where rather than going into furlough, we decided to dust off all of those long-term strategic plans over five or 10 years and try to compress them into about 18 months. And it's one of the uh, best things I think that we ever did. Now, if that is what some companies in the United Kingdom also did, that to some degree answers the majority of your question, because you'll understand that to be competitive in the United Kingdom as the world's fifth largest economy is one thing. But if you're going to succeed in exports across, like me, in 120 countries concurrently, then that must mean that you are navigating your way successfully through a greater array of competitive forces than you would be if you were just operating in, a, in one domestic market. And if you're managing to invent and innovate and respond to those greater array of competitors, that will make you a more successful business overall. And in fact, the government's export strategy, Joseph, specifically cites evidence for the fact that UK exporting companies, in other words, those companies in the UK who export are 20% more sustainable and more effective and more profitable than non-exporters, which I think may well support my thesis that if you export at all, you are a better company than being a non-exporter. And that will in itself give you the growth that you need 
to enable you the resilience and diversification that needs to occur for you to succeed as, as a global company. You've mentioned just then the challenges that arose um, during the pandemic and after the pandemic, but obviously there are the challenges that came uh, post Brexit as well. And the UK government has expressed a commitment to global Britain post Brexit. Um, how do you see this vision shaping the future of UK exports? So, uh, so your, my, my second best question of the year. Uh, thank you very much for asking that. So it's very complex and the answer I'm going to give uh, has no political um, basis whatsoever. A consequence of the country's decision to ask the government to discharge its responsibilities to meet its desires to leave the, the European Union had fundamental con uh, consequences, both disruptive and constructive. So the disruptive side was that you left a single market and where we had no barriers at all to exporting. So it was as easy for us to export to Central Europe as a country in Central Europe as it was for us to send something from Leicestershire to Dorset here at home. Now that, that generates a huge amount of thought if you have to then disrupt that and even if the disruption is minimal it is still something that has to be has to be considered and applied. And we did. We simply distracted ourselves with many years um, re reflecting on the decisions that we had made as a country. Today, I can say that due to what I would say is exceptional work by very bright civil servants, at the num at, particularly at number 10, and, and, uh, but across Whitehall, is that that wins a framework, which is still an imperfect outcome, is the best outcome that you could have given the circumstances of, of which the decision was made to leave. However, on the constructive side, you have to go back all the way to 2017 when major policy decisions were taking shape to say, well, where, how does the United Kingdom look across the world? And as you say, the phrase at the time that was used was global Britain. More interestingly than that, however, was if you take one region like the Indo-Pacific, what we used to call Asia or the Far East, then you'll see that there was a decision to make uh, a free trade agreement with Austria, Australia and New Zealand. And you might say, well, why is, why is that so important? They're not huge trading partners with the UK. But if we hadn't done that, then we wouldn't have ended up for the United Kingdom being the first European power to establish dialogue partner status with the collective regional grouping called ASEAN or join CPTPP, which accounts for 15% of the entire global economy. We wouldn't have made the decisions that we have with Japan, where we ramped up the science and technology agreements. In fact, and in fact that began in 2012 and ended up this year with the Hiroshima Accord with Japan, which is really an alliance in all but name, and the decision for the United Kingdom, Japan and Italy came in afterwards to design and manufacture the world's first um, sixth generation aircraft. Now behind you in your screen, you've got a picture of an aircraft and that's really important. Shipping and aerospace have been a huge part of my life, Joseph, but 17% of the value of every aircraft that flies over London every minute of every day is British. So if you imagine, well, how is it that the United Kingdom has maintained that cutting edge aerospace capability? You have to go all the way back to people like we know, like Barnes Wallace. But instead of thinking of what he did during the war, thinking of the 30 years contribution that he made to aeronautical engineering after the war, that's now all these years later, giving you the foundation to produce that extraordinary aircraft with all of the science and technology uh, possibilities that it gives us. And then at the strategic level, the United Kingdom, the USA and uh, Australia developed AUKUS. Now we think of that as a submarine program in what they call Pillar 1, but in Pillar 2 it's some of the most advanced technologies in the world. And that suggests to me that the reason that the, the EU exit, if it had a constructive outcome, it was that we suddenly saw the world in the way that, for instance, I was brought up to see it as, where you can now see a balanced uh, array of global markets and strategic agreements between Asia, America and Europe. 
And there is no question in my mind that you're beginning to see signs in the European Political Committee um, that, that everybody across Europe realises that it has in the future, you, I think you'll see more UK plus EU agreements than you've ever seen before. But the, but the, the constructive outcome from EU exit was our ability to now enter into those trade agreements, which are fundamental and strategic uh, of, in consequential terms for the United Kingdom. Therefore, the opportunities for us in those three great regions of the world are almost equal now in a way that before the emphasis was on one of them. And I think there's, there's therefore hope. And I'm not trying to be unduly an optimist, but I hope that's answered your question to some degree. Indeed, it has. Thank you. Um, and talking a bit more about the the trade agreements, um, post Brexit trade agreements, what is uh, BEXA in particular doing to help to promote free trade? So the great news on free trade, uh, I always find this um, really moving, is that over the last 40 years, free trade itself has released 1.5 billion people from poverty across the world. And I think that's magical to hold up, to hold on to. By the same token, free trade sometimes gets associated with the right politically in a way that seems to be unduly harsh. And so I frame it in these terms. If you go back to 1945, there's something that really exciting occurred. And the post-war government at home uh, created the National Health Service. But as part of the wider welfare state, and those two points are important because it was about extending dignity to our people at the time of their distress and to get them back into society, regardless of whether they were unwell, unemployed or, 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 or homeless. But, e but equally at home, we, um, we, we legislated and made it, uh, 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 we gave equality to women under the law. At home, uh, 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 that was at home. Overseas, we created the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, an equal member Commonwealth and NATO itself. And those two things, home and overseas, were all done at a time when GDP to debt was 250% uh, and bread itself was rationed for nine long years. The reason I say that is that when people talk about free trade, they forget what uh, the economist Adam Smith always said, which is that the government's role in free trade was to be the, um, uh, the hidden hand in, in unfettered markets, which, whose excess would otherwise depend on selfishness and greed, and those that couldn't participate in that would be disadvantaged. So the free trade that I speak to is something that is in a long line of positive, decent work and consideration since 1945. To answer your point, the decision to enter free trade agreements was fundamental. The United Kingdom is a, an independent, sovereign, free trade nation. But to express that government to government is important. But we must remember that in business, no part of UK business or UK industry uh, successfully trades within a free trade agreement. They, they successfully trade within the terms that are agreed with those agreements. And it's why I mentioned the Cross-Asia uh, Agreement, CPTPP, because that captures 15% of the entire world's GDP in one agreement. And the route to that was the policy decision in, in uh, Her Majesty's, uh, then Her Majesty's government to enter strategic FTAs with, people, with countries like Australia, which contained remarkable clauses such as taking account of technologies that hadn't even been invented in the future so that new inventions and new innovations would not impede the, the existing framework that had been agreed during those FDA. So I hope in a, in a way that's uh, answered some of your question. And I'd like to ask you now, Carl, about um, SMEs, because it's incredibly important that the UK government also supports our smaller businesses and their export endeavours. Um, what advice or what resources do you think that um, are being provided to these smaller businesses? Uh, so the UK economy is structured in a, in a, in a really unusual way. There are only 8,000 companies 
that employ over 250 people in this in, in our economy set in comparison to the 5.6 million SMEs who employ less than 249. So your question goes to the heart of who we are as an economic nation. Those SMEs, however, drive 54% of all UK private sector, re sector employment and 46% of all private sector revenue. And you invert that for the large corporates who do the reverse of that. They are developing 46% uh, of all private sector revenue and 54% uh, no, of all private sector revenue and 46% of all pr private sector uh, employment. Now that's fascinating. That means that 5.6 million companies who are considered small are actually driving half of the entire economy. Therefore, when the government says they're the engine room of economic growth in this country, that is true. And to, to get to the point of your question, the question then is, how do you wish to help those SMEs? And then you go through obvious policy considerations like corporation tax or uh, national insurance or PAY implications, whatever it might be. Whereas to me, there is a slightly more hopeful and romantic uh, element, which is how, if those companies are successfully exporting, what is it that you can do to add to their inventive, innovative um, and ideas base to encourage them to do more? And that's why, as a consequence of EU exit, although it had nothing to do with EU exit, I have to say, in reality, that is why the government put a lot of effort into ramping up R&D in this country from sub 2% to now the government aim of 2.4%, which broadly is a couple of points above the defence budget to give you an idea of scale. And I think it's probably in that science and technology space where the SMEs need to be encouraged to collaborate more with the university sector. You know, after all, I think we, we it's commonly understood that we generate more Nobel Prize winners for science at one Cambridge college than the entire nation of a, of a peer European competitor country uh, and, and that gives you an indication of the massive what the americans would call delta between world leading science on the one side and economic opportunity on the other and um i know that one particular challenge for um, exporters and for smes is um, accessing financial resources to support their overseas ventures what kind of financial programs or or support um, is available to them in order to access the necessary funding for international expansion? So there's a small part of government which people don't um, always know, and it's called UK Export Finance. In fact, it's the world's oldest uh, national credit agency. And over the last year, for instance, UKEF, as it is abbreviated and known, has helped uh, over 500 uh, SMEs to export. And the way that f fundamentally the basis of that is that the exporter seeks finance from its own bank. And when the bank is concerned about that risk, uh, then UKEF is brought in to underwrite 80% of the total value of that risk, thereby freeing the SME to proceed with their export hope. Um, and UKF has offices all over the world, uh, at, at personnel based at, at the diplomatic network of embassies and high commissions and consulates that the U UK Foreign Office has overseas. And to enable that, UKF has made its arrangements with the top five of the UK's largest banks. So my, my route to, to answer the question of the SME who says, I can't afford to export, is to really understand why they can't afford to export if this this provision this national provision exists to effectively underwrite or ensure their export risk that they are concerned about and for those who didn't already know carl you're also the chairman of cold traco ultrasonics which specializes in safety and security solutions in the context of international trade, what safety and security challenges do you think exporters face and how can your company's expertise address these challenges? Uh, thank you for asking. Um, so I'm very proud of the company. Uh, um, you know, we started we started in a shed 
um, you know, with my father, uh, a, a remarkable, a remarkable journey. Um, either way, if you take this, you have a ship behind you in in your screen, and if you take the shipping industry, the number one reason for ships being lost at sea remains sinking, and the number two is fire. And there are about fifty-five to sixty thousand large ships like the one behind you at sea at any one time. And today we are aboard nearly 20% of that entire world's fleet because we use ultrasound, which is merely sound outside the audible range of a human being, such as a bat or a dolphin may use, um, if you think of David Attenborough programs. And we use that to check the watertight integrity of the ship so that we can prevent catastrophic failure on the one hand and sinking. And then on the other, those ships are protected by very high pressure gaseous extinguishing systems and were the global leader in the monitoring of those systems which if they were to accidentally leak or discharge would not enable the design concentration to develop to extinguish the fire event if we go on on land then and, and we call that a, our safe ship concept so we are doing whatever we can to design and manufacture equipment that can safeguard lives at sea vessels and cargoes and on land, we're doing the same thing. So if you go into a data center, you can imagine the sheer amount of cabling, the sheer amount of heat that's generated by those computers has to be controlled, and the fire risk is very high. So we are the leading company in the world to monitor again those very sophisticated gaseous extinguishing systems um, that are there to prevent fire in the event that it, that it occurs. Um, we're, the, we're, the globe, we're the world's top 35 supplier into one of the world's largest offshore and onshore wind energy companies. So we use our technologies basically from the simple public service premise that if we can design something to save a life, if we can do something to save uh, a piece of critical national infrastructure, then we merit generating profit, if you like, and livelihoods from that. But it has to be predicated on the basis that what we're doing is is of substance and is of good. And that's something which you don't always know when you start up a business, when you can't afford to pay a bill. And it's something which you arrive at and then you celebrate it because you suddenly realize that very few people have the gift of that to have. And in my own organization, where we're actually inventing things that have never been invented before, writing software code that's never been done before, <laughs> being able to integrate our equipment and systems globally into networks that can be monitored and controlled from another place than the systems themselves are protected. I feel that's a pretty exciting thing. And in some ways, we're at the cutting in edge of specific parts of physics, and mathematics, hence why uh, we're very fortunate to have a scientific research in, um, institute at Durham University, which took about four years to create. But we've got some of the most magnificent scientists in, the, in this country now. Whereas I look back 20 years ago and we couldn't even afford to have a scientist in the company. We, we uh, used to have to subcontract expensive lab space. We never had enough time in it because we couldn't afford it. We never had a decent academics to talk to. You know, and I, so I, I really do look at the company today as almost the second iteration of it and the hope and opportunity that we can give to the people within it of all ages, by the way. You know, we've got people working in the company from single mothers in India through to people in their 60s, and, uh, yeah, 60s who are in their third careers, um, that come out of retirement to, 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 to get their brains going again in a different environment, right through to young, future, potential at least, Nobel Prize winners for science. And that's a magical thing for me because an organisation can be defined as many things. Uh, but the best one that I think of it as is as the sum of the individuals within it. So if you and I were in the same company, it would be about our collective and joint endeavour that then describes the organisation, not the organisation into something being something that you and I slot into to perform given roles. It's about that magical ability of the human being to be something different to a machine learning experience and get up in the morning with hope whilst you're doing your administrative duties that enable the environment for us to have those hopeful ideas and then to translate those ideas into the very inventions and innovations that to your earlier question enable you to begin to be able to deliver 
the resilience, diversification and growth that is what you need in today's competitive and contested world, underpinned in our case by the principle of being better, faster, cheaper across our global markets, including you know, countries in Asia where you think the UK would never be able to compete, but you can because we're the eighth largest manufacturing nation in the world. And it's just typically English that because we're not number one, we think any other number in that league is is awful. But it's actually quite remarkable that you are the fifth largest economy in the world. You are the fifth largest exporting nation. You're the second largest exporter of services in the world. And you're the eighth largest manufacturing nation. So it's quite a potent mix if you if you if you don't allow yourself to get gloomy um, by, what, what, by what you see elsewhere. Well, you've just pointed out some incredible achievements and all of the work that you're that you've just explained is is fantastic um so much so that um as i recently read in one of your papers um you receive not just once but twice an award uh, the queen's award for enterprise and international trade um, how did it feel to receive such an honor um in recognition of all of this hard work well, uh, that's actually the most generous question I've been asked all year. So I'm very grateful to you, Joseph. Um, so when we won it, it was the Queen's Award before Her Majesty's passing, and now it's the King's Award. Firstly, I'd, I can't commend more highly the civil servants that drive the King's Award for Enterprise and, uh, Office. And the, the, it's interesting to think that of those 5.6 million companies in a year, only 200 a year win what, those awards. And therefore, it really is the United Kingdom's highest award. Anyway, to make you smile, we applied for that award, as I remember, three times and failed um, in the years before. And those and those submissions took us about 40 hours of work when we didn't have the time anyway. And so we lost, we lost, we lost, and then we won. And then we won again. And the reason we won is that we were able to demonstrate uh, five or six years of continuous growth in exporting. And and that was underpinned by the technological stuff that we've been discussing. It was great pleasure earlier. And I'd love to take this opportunity to say that one of the things I'm, I'm proud of is being having been appointed a King's Award for Enterprise Champion by the government. And I, I would, I'd love to take this opportunity if I may, Jason. Just that if your listeners are running businesses, I would really encourage them to to go to the effort of, of going to the website, the King's Award for Enterprise, and making their submission. Because when you go to Buckingham Palace and you are basically given your award, you suddenly realise that what you're doing in business plays an equal, equally important part as those in government. So for me, it's an extension of what I was talking about earlier and what drives us in the company of bringing people of all ages together and creating an organization that then becomes the sum of those individuals. The same thing in our economy. I now see it in a different way to when I was younger. I see it as, as about trying to align the public and private sectors in a national and shared endeavor to succeed both in her, at home and overseas. And the King's, the King's Award for Enterprise, um, the other two, the Queen's Award for Enterprise, is, uh, is yes, it's 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 one of our hugest uh, celebrations, and and I'm so proud, and I'm very grateful to you mentioning it by the way. So thank you. Um, finally, Carl, I just wanted to ask um, about your work with the Durham Institute of Research, Development, and Invention. Um, what would you like to tell us about this? What have been the the milestone achievements here? So thank you. So, so during COVID-19, do I, I mentioned that we didn't go to fellow and we'd had a plan for years. We put an application in to the Senate of Durham University, where I'm a visiting professor. and I've worked for 15 years with undergraduates, um, in, in the, specifically uh, many of them scientists. Anyway, we dusted that off and encouraged the University of Senate to let us um, establish the Durham Institute of uh, Research, Development and Invention. And they did. So three years to four years work. And then in the middle of COVID, we get this amazing letter from the Vice Chancellor of the University saying, next year you can begin in partnership with Durham University. And that has five aims. And I'll race through them. The first, the first aim is to conduct Edisonian commercialization to diversify us away from ultrasonics 
into acoustics, electromagnetism, and what we call engineered information. The second is, is more public service, is to conduct Newtonian discovery. To, so to conduct public service science, to understand more of the fundamental physical laws of the universe. The third aim is really exciting, I think, is to identify uh, the United Kingdom's next Isaac Newton, whoever he or she is. The fourth is to identify early stage future Nobel Prize winners for science, understanding that the average age of a Nobel Prize winner for science in the UK is 43. So if you identify at 23, that hugely bright young scientist, and then create a nurturing environment for them for the next 20 years, by which I mean not just scientifically, but that they're bound to have two or three downs in their life. It could be a financial event, a bereavement, or something else hugely important to them, an illness perhaps. And I want us to be the first institute in the UK where the scientists can not just treat us in a scientific way, but treat us as a, as a, a scientific family that they can come to and get nurtured so they never lose hope to become that Nobel Prize winner. And the fifth aim is you will know that the Northeast is a distressed uh, uh, area economically, and I want us to become an econ a, a regional hub for those people across the Northeast who have an idea, an invention, or an innovation, so that they can come to the Institute and we can match them to an academic to get them on their path to their economic hope. So if you note of those five aims, four of them are really public service, which goes back to my earlier point that I fundamentally encourage your listeners and, and uh, viewers rather to try and imagine a business in which you're, you're catering for all of the day-to-day -day worries and your own economic hope but but think of that Adam Smith comment of being your own hidden hand so that you create a business that is predicated on a grander um, public service basis because all of your success will accrue from that good natured and decent place that broadly most British people come from. It's just we get knocked around a little by life and we think that those values are unimportant, whereas I think they are our most critical ones. And that's why I'm pleased to see the UK do, of whatever political colour it is now or in the future, I think you'll find that those policies to integrate us into the world and to put the best values forward first so that we can deliver through the private sector the achievements and the hope for the country that we that they deserve. I think that's the future. And so to answer your question, the Research Institute is something we never could afford to do. It's Durham's, I think, only 11th scientific institute. And so if you create an in, a research institute in this country, which is already a science superpower and an incredible university sector, then yes, I'm pretty proud of that. And uh, I'm pleased to report that since January, we have now, since January 23, we began recruiting and we just appointed our 114th professor to the Institute. I aim to get to 200 by the end of the year. And on that, I wish to say this, I suddenly discovered as I got a little older that professors were like generals or prime ministers or whatever, they, or business leaders. They, they hadn't always achieved the ambition that they had when they first went into their fields. I want the Institute to be a place where those unfulfilled ambitions of those extraordinary senior professors or associate professors can be matched to the scientific hope of our young scientists and meet both their un original ambition that brought them into science at all together with the technological uh, innovation that we need to succeed in a very competitive and contested world. So I hope that's answered your question. Well, thank you once again, Carl. I think that was a perfect message um, to conclude this interview. Um, thank you so much for joining us today at International Trade Live, and I hope that we have the pleasure of speaking with you again in the future. I'm very grateful to you, Sam, David, and all of your team. You're, a, you're an incredible one, and, and thank you for all that you're doing in your own public service work, by the way, which I think has come through in this time with you. So thank you for the opportunity. Well, thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. All right. God bless you. Thank you very much.